I'm delighted to, uh, to see so many of you here today. I really do feel like uh, Angelina Jolie. <laughs> um, I have actually uh, put on your various um, seats a, um, a piece of paper which contains some key figures about entrepreneurs. Uh, these uh, figures have been computed by the Agence um, Professionnelle pour la uh, Agence pour la création d'entreprise, so that's agency for uh, the creation of, uh, of uh, businesses, and um, so it's a French agency. But I think that those stats will probably be also relevant for businesses, uh, uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial businesses in the UK. So if you would like to browse through the figures for around 30 seconds, and then we can, we can have a, a look together at this data. Okay, so I think that uh, um, you've probably had a good grasp of what it says out on there. And I'm sure that you have um, noticed that more than 50% of entrepreneurs start with less than 2,000 euros. Um, just to clarify, the status of auto-entrepreneur means that um, is, it's, it is a, a status which under French law means that you start a business while having another um, activity on the side or some other uh, uh, income on the side. So for example, you have some additional income from coming from a, a, a full-time or part-time job. Uh, you'll have some pension or you'll have some redundant, you have some unemployment benefits. And at the same time, you start your business. So you are an auto-entrepreneur. Um, so, so, so yes, yeah, so 77 percent of uh, of uh, uh, people start as auto entrepreneurs, i.e., they have some income on the side when they start their new venture, and um, as I mentioned before, 53 percent of uh, uh, entrepreneurs in whole, even those who are starting full time, uh, start with less than 2,000 pounds, uh, 2,000 euros. Apologies. Um, out of those which are not auto-entrepreneurs, so they are full-time entrepreneurs, they are dedicating all their time to their venture, 35% um, of them start with more than 16,000 16, euros. But at the other side of the range, you've got 20% of um, full-time entrepreneurs uh, who start with less than 2,000 euros. So there is definitely a, a, a difficulty for, uh, for entrepreneurs to actually find some financing. Only 5% of entrepreneurs in whole uh, take advantage of grants and subsidies. That is not much. And um, yeah, so 49% of entrepreneurs use their own money, savings, bootstrapping. 15% um, take a bank loan in the name of a new business. 7% take a bank loan in the name of, uh, in their own name, and, um, and as I said, 5% use grants. So, um, how do entrepreneurs make their companies live during the first few years? Well, mostly they reinvest the turnover from their business into, into their, uh, their ongoing uh, business, but they also raise funds. This is how they make their company go on year after year. Um, after three years of, uh, of uh, starting their business, 66% of companies are still functioning. What is quite interesting, and what is the main factor um, to predict the durability of a business? It is actually the will and the, of the entrepreneur. The, the more the entrepreneur is dedicated to have his business go on for the long term, the, the, the higher probability that the durability rate will be high. Actually, it's quite interesting to note that quite one out of ten entrepreneurs, when they start, they know that their venture will not uh, last for more than one or two years. So if you keep those entrepreneurs with a very short-term um, short span, short-term uh, goal on the side, 69%, 69% of uh, new businesses um, have um, a dur durability higher than three years. So. The fees figures are actually quite high um, in France. I suppose that in, I think that in the UK they are slightly lower. I think they are less than 50% of businesses in the UK which, uh, which are still going on after three years. So what is also quite interesting is that you can see that these... Um, good morning. <laughs> these entrepreneurs um, are all in all doing quite well after a few years. They turn over after three years is for 69% of them higher than 32,000 euros. Still, 31% of them still make 
less or just 32,000 euros. But there are even some companies, some, um, some, some new businesses making more than or 760,000 euros. That's 5% of them. So the, these figures are actually quite positive. Um, my advice on this is do not underestimate your project at the seed stage. The seed stage is when you are just starting. I'll, I'll come back to this concept of seed stage bef uh, uh, in, in a second. But the <coughs> The more you are able to, to work out your working capital requirements, i.e. Um, the time frame that it will take you for your products to actually become cash, liquid, liquid to become some cash, the, the, the better you are in terms of uh, uh, making sure that you are able to uh, assess your, uh, your, your financing needs. The, the, the biggest problem you could be into is when you have not done a, an appropriate assessment of your working capital requirements and um, in a few months you have to actually go back to your banker to ask for a new credit line such as an overdraft or a, a short-term facility. So it's really important to cal calculate accurately those working capital requirements. Just to give you perhaps uh, uh, um, another definition of working capital requirements, it, the working capital requirements are when the credits obtained from your suppliers um, are not enough to finance the stocks and credits granted to your clients. On the co contrary, a company has some working capital resources when the, credit it, the credits it has obtained from um, its suppliers are enough to cover the financing of the stocks and the credits granted to clients. So working capital uh, is managing your working capital is going to be the most important thing, one of the most important things you'll have to do when you start your business. Um, sorry. <coughs> Access to finance remains a critical barrier to the success of uh, entrepreneurial businesses. Ernest and Young issued a report in 2011 about entrepreneurial finance and um, out two thirds of the entrepreneurs who were interviewed for the purpose of uh, uh, finalising this report said that they found it very difficult to raise some financing in their respective countries. So today we're going to assess the key funding challenges that, um, uh, that entrepreneurs experience and provide some recommendations for action that could be taken to actually meet your financing requirements along the, uh, the, the, the line, along the, uh, the life of your business. There are four stages in a business as is set out on this slide. The third stage is pre-seed and seed financing. Then you come to the startup stage then to the emerging growth stage and then to the um, expansion stage. And as you can see, here you've got high risk when it's at the seed and startup stage and the longer, you know, the durability of the business, the track record of the, uh, of the uh, entrepreneurs and the lower the risk. So that means that you've got different types of financing available for uh, each stage of your venture. The ideal scenario would be to have um, some appropriate means of financing for each stage of a development and to have a smooth transition from one stage to the other. To the other. Obviously that would be the best case scenario. However, um, today it's a, a little bit difficult because there are some funding gaps. I'll come to this point about funding gaps in a second. No two companies are alike in terms of their financing needs. It depends on the business model. For example, a, a high-tech startup will have probably less working capital requirements than a a uh, fashion startup because um, you can actually make an app or a software just by using a MacBook and, uh, and um, an iPhone and a good internet connection. Well, in the fashion business, obviously, you need to have a bit more means to actually create your products. In particular, you need to have access to fabrics, material, um, 
dispose of threads, you need to have also some uh, to take into account some labor costs to actually um, have people making your your, uh, your 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 products. Or if you don't do it in house, then you also need to source it out to some suppliers and manufacturers. All this is going to cost money. I wouldn't say that fashion startups are the most resource intensive ones. Obviously, if you want to start a mining business, that's going to be much more intensive because you have to uh, to buy some uh, some enormous trucks and uh, and lots of uh, lo lots of tools, etc. But I would say that fashion startups are probably in the middle in terms of the working capital requirements when you start compared to high tech startups or etc. So, um, as I was mentioning before. There is clear evidence that some large gaps have appeared along the funding escalator in the wake of a financial crisis. And Ernest and Young conclusion, uh, deriving from this 2011 report, is that these gaps make it difficult for entrepreneurial companies to um, start up and grow. And that means that they are unable to play the role that they should in, in enabling a sustained economic recovery. Big companies are at the moment not really hiring, they're even firing. So a lot of, um, in particular, young graduates coming out in the market, they want to create their own businesses because that's a way to actually have a job. But it's difficult for them to have access to finance. So the funding gaps are uh, mainly around here. I'll come back to that in a second, but then when you come to the um, business angel to seed uh, to, uh, to venture capital uh, requirements, this is where the funding gap is mainly. So, funding sources at the pre seed and seed stage. How do you get some financing? Pre-seed and seed stage is where the entrepreneurial business is just being established. The entrepreneur is thinking about how to make its prototypes, its, um, its new products, and um, it's basically the entrepreneur is uh, assessing the viability of its business model, of his business model, sorry. So the financing needs are still relatively small, even smaller than, um, than a few years ago, because thanks to um, the advances of technology in particular, now starting up, doing a, do, doing a new venture is, is less expensive. If you think, for example, of cloud computing and some other um, uh, tech advancements, it's, it's easier to have all the appropriate tools at your disposal at, at uh, a cheaper cost than a few years ago. So we're going to talk about, um, let's call him John Alexander, a uh, talented graduate from Central St. Martins who's just graduated from the fashion um, master uh, under the uh, direction of Louise Wilson. He is a protégé of, Will Wilson, of Louise Wilson. His whole graduate collection was actually purchased by a fashionista during the graduate show. He's got a bright future ahead of him, John Alexander. So we're going to follow his evolution and his business evolution uh, while he creates his own fashion label. Well, first port of call, friends, family and fools, what we call in, French, in France love money. So John Alexander, um, as I said, wants to start his, uh, his, uh, his fashion lab label. He's got some savings, um, some inheritance money that he got from uh, one of his grandparents who died a few years ago. So he, he, he takes £5,000 from his uh, piggy bank and um, that that's is uh, his the start of his uh, uh, raising of seeing money. £5,000 coming from uh, bootstrapping. Now he goes to his parents and uh, he explains that mom and dad, I really want to start this fashion label. Um, you know uh, that uh, this is what I've been d wanted to do since I was uh, five years old. Um, can you give me a hand? His dad says, fine, we'll give you a hand, John Alexander, but we've worked hard for this money, for this 10 grand that we're going to lend you. So you're going to pay us um, an, a small interest rate on this uh, 10,000 pounds that we are going to, uh, um, to lend you. And um, John Alexander is a, 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 a fashion guy, but he's also a business savvy person. And he cannot afford to go and see a lawyer straight away because he doesn't, have, doesn't want to, to, to put money in this. But he goes to his citizen, Citizens Advice Bureau uh, uh, of his borough and um, he gets the help from an advisor to understand what he's supposed to do to actually have this, business, this um, 
uh, personal loan put in place with his parents. The advisor says, well, I, I, I think in order to avoid family rifts and problems in the future, it's really important to have your uh, loan set out in, in writing, so to have a, a written loan agreement. And there's going to be, as you mentioned, an interest rate attached to this loan. So you have to say to your parents that they will have to pay some income tax on these earnings, on the interest that they will, uh, that they will get from, uh, from, from you paying this interest. So please bear in mind that uh, there are some tax implications <coughs> to um, putting this interest-bearing loan in place with your parents. So John Alexander is fine with that. He goes to his mum and dad, says, OK, I've written my, my, the loan agreement. Are you OK to sign it? Parents say, yes, he's got 10 grand. So that's five grand from his savings, 10 grand from, hi from his parents. He's got 15 grand. His goal is to get to raise around 30,000 pounds of seed money. So he's, he's, he's progressing quite well, but he's not quite there yet. So now he goes to his nan. And um, he says, Grandma, I really would like to actually uh, start this fa fashion label. You know how keen I have been um, in, uh, of, of doing this since, for, since, since I was a little uh, a kid. Uh, could you give me a hand? His nanny <coughs> says, OK, that's fine. I'll, I'll make a gift. I'll give, you, I'll give you some money. I'll make a donation to you. And I'll give you £5,000 for this year. That's, that's fine. Um, John Alexander just wants to check that everything is watertight, so he goes back to the Citizens Advice Bureau. I mean, he could have gone also to the Consumer Credit Counselling Service, but the Citizens Advice Bureau is closer to his, uh, to his house. So anyway, the advisor there says, um, John Alexander, it's not going to be possible because, you know, um, a donation, a gift in England is actually subject to um, inheritance tax, okay? And um, in, in England, you've got an exemption an annual exemption of £3,000. So the highest sum of money that your grand grandmother could give you is actually £3,000 this year. Okay? And that she could also give you a few um, cash gifts of no more than £250, um, as many as she wants this year. But otherwise, the only donation she can make you is £3,000 this year. Goes back to his nan, they actually draft, um, write a, down a, a donation agreement between his grandmother and him, and, um, and she makes a donation of £3,000. So now John Alexon has got £18,000 of seed money, which is good, he's doing well. So um, he goes to the pub to catch up with his mate David, and uh, David is, uh, is, is, a few, is, is a little bit older than him and now he's, a, he's, a, he's an associate in, a, in an investment bank um, in the city, uh, Merrill Lynch Bank of America. So David, David is making quite a lot of money. And David says, well, John Alexander, I'm thrilled you know, that you're starting your, uh, your uh, fashion label. Fantastic stuff. I'd be happy to invest in it you know, um, as, a, as an equity investor. And um, yeah, so um, whenever you are ready, I'm happy to uh, give you some cash in, in exchange for some um, uh, equity share holding in your company. So John Alexander thinks about it and he knows it has a seed and pre-seed stage. He's not even done his prototypes yet, you know, his products. So he goes back to David and he says, David, thank you so much for the offer. But right now, I don't think I'm really ready to get some business angel money in my venture. I'll come back to you in a second. This is parenthesis. I'll explain to you later what the business angel is. Um, so I'm not quite sure that I'm ready to have equity investment in my company yet because Actually, I don't want to incorporate a company yet. I want to work as a sole trader while I'm at the seed stage. So I don't want to incorporate a company. It's a bit too early for me. So I'll bear your offer in mind when I need to raise some equity investment. But for the moment, David, I think I'll be fine. So 18,000 pounds, that's where he's at. And he needs, um, he needs 30,000. So, um, He's got a mentor, John Alexander, and his mentor is called Gareth. Gareth uh, has also set up his own fashion label and um, a few years ago, so he's got a bit more experience than John Alexander. And Gareth says to uh, John Alexander, I really do think that you should also apply for grants, you know. Um, it's, it's, you, could, you should really look at all possible avenues to raise, uh, to raise this funding that you need, John Alexander. So John Alexander applies. There's been this great scheme which has been set up in uh, England, which is called Startup Britain. It's a, well, it's a 112 million pounds um, loan scheme set up by this government, which offers 18 to 30 years old, un, old entrepreneurs some loans of around 2,500 pounds um, to actually start up a business. 
The interest rate, I think, personally, is a bit high. It's around 6%, 6.25% APR. I personally think it's a bit high, but it's nonetheless worth applying um, for these £2,000. So what John Alexander does is that he goes to Alison Louis, um, who is the um, founder of Fashion Angel. Fashion Angel is a, an organisation... UK? Uh, no, no, it's all right. I hope I'm not speaking too fast or anything. Uh, Okay, fine. So, uh, Fashion Angel is an organization which basically uh, supports fashion entrepreneurs in uh, raising some funds, understanding what their market is, um, finding some distribution channels. So, he goes to Alison Louis from um, a Fashion Angel and she applies on his behalf, um, with him really, to get this uh, 2500 loan from uh, Startup Britain. Bang, he gets that. Great. Now, he goes to uh, the British Fashion Council. He's heard about their new James Skin scheme um, that is some support provided to catwalk designers um, to towards the financial cost of doing their shows and also some support in, find in terms of finding them some space where they can actually do their catwalks. Um, the British Fashion Can Council New James Scheme also sponsors the presentation and exhibition spaces to showcase the collections. Okay, so um, Mary Catron Zoo, Christopher Kane, and her dem have actually benefited from the new gen scheme. John Alexander applies to this, and he gets he gets in. He could also have applied to Fashion Fringe. Fashion Fringe was set up in 2003 by Colin McDowell and the ta talent agency IMG Fashion. Um, fashion Fringe nurtures some talents, such as Fashion Fringe winners Erdem or Fyodor and Golan, who are actually um, here with us today. So if you would like to speak to Fyodor and Golan after the, uh, after the uh, um, presentation to know more about Fashion Fringe, please do not hesitate. And um, the Fashion Fringe is an annual an annual award platform offering some talented emerging designers the chance to launch their label in London through a combined programme of mentoring, studio space, financial support and a catwalk show um, at London Fashion Week. Fashion Fringe is, a, is an IMG event. And uh, finally, John Alexander, who is still short around £10,000, applies to the creative industry finance um, to the, sorry, to, he applies for a Creative Industry Finance Loan. Creative Industry Finance is an initiative from the Art Council England and it was launched in March 2013. It provides creative industries entrepreneurs with loans between 5,000 and um, 25,000 pounds. So quite a lot of money actually if you get, if you get in. And um, yeah, it also obviously includes fashion entrepreneurs and it's limited to p people who are based in London, Yorkshire and Humber for now. Don't ask me why. So anyway, um, John Alexander applies and he gets in as well. So he's got his 30 grand. It's called uh, the Creative Industry Finance. And it's uh, an initiative of uh, the Art Council England. Right, so... Um, John Alexander would like also to give a go to a new peer-to-peer -peer channel that is heard of, which is called crowdfunding. Um, now he's actually done his prototypes and his products while he was, he benefited from this, I don't know, 20 pounds, 20,000 pounds that he raised through seed finance. So he's done his prototypes, he's, he's done the designs that he wants to do for his menswear uh, um, fa fashion label. And um, so he's got something to present really to the world. Um, I would say that he's got, he starts to have some proof of concept. I, he can actually prove, he can demonstrate that he's got uh, some products that he can actually sell. This is just the start of a proof of concept, but it's a start. So what is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding is a way of attracting small amounts of funding or donations directly from multiple investors using social media and internet channels. One of the most successful and famous um, crowdfunding site is actually called Kickstarter. In 2012, I believe, Amanda Palmer, an American musician, raised $1.2 million out of a Kickstarter campaign. So 
um, it, it was really a great, great platform for the creative industries. Throughout its, uh, sorry, since its inception, Kickstarter has raised $4.39 million for fashion startups. Apparently, this is actually quite a low success rate. It's only a success rate of 26.76%. But hey, it's $4.39 million that they've raised for fashion start startups. So it might be an avenue to look at, you know, putting a fashion, a fashion uh, campaign on Kickstarter. However, um, John Alexander is a keen reader of L UK, and he's seen last week that a new uh, crowdfunding platform has actually launched in London, I mean in the UK, um, in relation to, which is dedicated, sorry, to fashion entrepreneurs. And we actually have today the uh, founder of uh, this uh, crowdfunding platform called Audacity of Fashion, who is referred to us, Muriel Dupas. So over to you in a few words to present us uh, what, uh, what Audacity of Fashion is. Thank you, Annabelle. So I am the founder of Audacity of Fashion, if you just um, which is a crowdfunding platform dedicated to fashion. Um, obviously, uh, I've been working for business angel uh, networks and it was quite difficult to get funding for early stage businesses and uh, as we've seen with Annabelle's statistics uh, more than 50% um, of um, the entrepreneurs, fashion entrepreneurs um, are fun funding their businesses uh, with their own money. So why not uh, draw on the power of uh, your crowd, your fans and followers um, to get this funding? Um, and when I uh, was asking people why don't you go to Kickstarter, um, some fashion businesses were a bit reluctant to go there because it was all about video games and so on. So I said, well, let's just start um, a crowdfunding platform that will be only dedicated to uh, fashion businesses. So if you want more info, I'll be there after the talk. Thank okay. you. Thank you very so much, Muriel. So what is interesting about this uh, crowdfunding site is that in exchange for the, um, small, the amount of money which the in, uh, investors are putting into the business, which is dead money, by the way, it's not equity, it's dead money, um, you, they get in exchange uh, some small rewards. So for example, I saw this uh, uh, funny um, fashion campaign in, uh, in Kickstarter, whereby uh, if you would finance this um, uh, Chicago-based menswear uh, label, you would get a tie and a, and a bow tie if you would put $60 in the, in the campaign and you would get two bow ties and one tie if you, get 100, if you put 100. So um, yeah, and another avenue is to also apply for Wow Crazy. Wow Crazy is not really a crowdfunding site, it's um, actually, uh, they call themselves a pre-order based fashion community dedicated to fashion designers and brands. So you place your order on Wow Crazy um, with the uh, designer that you like and then uh, no money is taken from your account initially and either fashion designer uh, manages to have enough orders to actually raise his, his, his targets then your account will be debited, your order will be processed and, and that is that. So John Alexander as I said is a savvy guy and he, he, he's thinking well hang on if I put all my designs and also I mentioned the name of my, my brand, my label on, on, my, uh, on uh, this uh, uh, crowdfunding um, campaign, that means that everything will, everyone will know about it. And I don't want to, be, I don't want to have my, my products knocked off. I don't want to have my designs knocked off. So how do I, what do I do? As I said, he's a, a, a next graduate from Central St. Martins, which is part of the University of the Arts London. And he knows that there is a non-profit organization um, at University of the Arts London, which is called Own It, which provides some uh, free intellectual property advice to uh, fashion entrepreneurs in particular. So he goes to the Own It, um, Own it IP clinic and explains his, his, his concerns. Uh, the uh, trainee lawyer, because very often trainee lawyers who are at the IP clinic, uh, tells him, well, fa what I think you should do, John Alexander, is that I think now is the right time for you to actually apply for uh, the registration of your trademark with the UK Intellectual Property Office, since, as you said, you're going to put it out there in the public domain by putting your uh, crowdfunding campaign. So 
this should not deter you from starting the crowdfunding campaign because uh, as soon as you've applied um, on for at, with the UK uh, Intellectual Property Office for registration of your trademark, that it will be deemed to be protected from day one, from the application date. Okay, so that's the first thing. And also, John Alexander, this uh, law solicitor tells him, is I think you should think about uh, your strategy to protect your designs. You have a 12 months grace period when you um, actually, from sorry, you've got a 12 months grace period during which you can actually register your designs with either the UK Intellectual Property Office or if you want to have a community registered design, then you will apply with HOIM, which is the organization um, of um, um, the um, HOIM is Organization for Harmonization of the Internal Market, which is based in Spain. Um, and obviously, if you have a community registered design, then it will be protected within the European Union. So you've got that 12 months grace period, John Alexander, during which you can assess which uh, designs are the best sellers, and uh, therefore you can actually, um, within that 12 months grace period, register those ones so that you are sure that they are protected and nobody will, uh, uh, will, will copy them. So, with this information, John Alexander started to start his uh, crowdfunding campaign and he uh, manages his to achieve his target of £30,000. Now, John Alexander um, is at the startup stage. He begins the process of demonstrating the commercial viability of his business. Um, he starts to make some initial revenues, to start his, he starts to sell his products, he identifies some sales and distribution channels and builds some awareness of um, his business. So, the financing needs that he's experiencing at this stage are a bit higher because he needs to recruit some staff, um, he needs to have some marketing people on board, some sales people on board, um, he needs to invest into infrastructure. He can't work from his bedroom anymore, he needs to have a studio space. Um, and also he needs to put his business plan into action. So the common challenges at this stage for, um, for st st startup entrepreneurs is that Basically, uh, it's still considered a high-risk moment for the company, for, for, for the company, and a lot of banks and also equity investors are still quite reluctant to invest in uh, in, um, in startups. Um, so, basically, startups still mean they face the same issues than companies which are at the seed stage, and where we keep on. Um, having recourse to bootstrapping their own savings and also uh, see, I mean, reaching out to their friends and family to, to, to make the business survive. However, some business angels might become interested in their uh, venture. So business angels, now is the moment to actually define that term. A business angel is an affluent individual, like the David I mentioned before, um, who often are um, successful business people in their own right and who has decided to invest a portion of uh, his or her wealth into, um, in, in, into other companies. So what is good with business angels is that because they are, uh, uh, I mean, they have um, um, made it in their own, r in, sorry, because they are successful uh, business people themselves, they can also be mentors to the young entrepreneur. And uh, often they can also uh, be an advocate for your business. So it's important to find the right fit when you're actually looking for a business angel. He needs to provide the money, but it would be great as well if he's a, he or she is a good mentor uh, and uh, a good advocate for your business. So, so business angels organize themselves in networks or uh, groups, angel groups. And in the UK, there are some excellent uh, tax incentive schemes uh, which business angel, angels always use, which are called the Enterprise Investment Scheme and the uh, Small Enterprise Investment Scheme. So, the UK is actually a very good place for business angel money. In Europe, it's probably the largest um, market for business angel money. There are um, 624 business angels in the UK, and uh, that is around $74 million of, uh, of uh, business angel money in the, in, the, in, the, in the market in the UK. So that's, that's quite substantial and this is the right place to find business and equity money. Um, as I mentioned to you before, there is a funding gap and it's, get, it's got worse and worse with the, um, with, the, um, uh, with the financial crisis since 2007. Basically companies uh, which have 
funding requirements between $25,000 and $500,000 are usually served quite well by the business angel community. And then companies which have funding requirements above $3 million are usually served well by the venture capital um, uh, community, which is the second stage to equity money. You've got business angel, venture capital, and then private equity. We'll come back to private equity and VCs in a, in a, in a moment. But the companies which have um, ca capital requirements between $500,000 and $3 million are ba basically sitting between two stools. So this is where the funding gap is. So this, there, there has been some successful investment by business angels in the fashion sector. I'm thinking here in particular of Francesco Maio, who is an Italian um, citizen, but he's a tax resident in France. And Francesco Maio has been recently cited as being in the top 10 business angels uh, in France by the French business magazine Challenges. So he's really a guy to w watch out. He's investing in at least four fashion startups. Um, one of them being called Instant Lux. Instant Lux is a platform on which buyers and sellers can actually meet <coughs> to um, trade second-hand luxury items, such as a Hermes Kelly bag or uh, some great jewelry from Tiffany. And what is great about Instant Lux is that they also um, recall, I mean, they use the services of valuers people who, whose business is to actually value luxury items so that they can check the authenticity of the, of the product, check that it is not counterfeited, and also that they can also do an assessment uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the price of such a second-hand uh, product. Instant Lux is so successful that is na it has now started to also trade in the UK. It used to be a French website only, <coughs> and now it's also started in the UK. And uh, the point I'm trying to make is that all Francesco Mayer's investment in fashion startups are actually fashion slash tech startups. He's actually selected investments which are all very much um, geared towards the onli online consumer market. This is really something to bear in mind. Um, at the moment, a lot of investors, equity investors, are let's say it, only interested in investing in fashion slash tech startups um, because they want a lot of, uh, 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 quickly, they want a return on the, on the investment of their money. I'll, I'll, I'll explain more in, in, a, in a few more details what I mean by that in a second. Basically, the right moment for, uh, let's go back to John Alexander, to approach um, business angels is when you've got proof of concept. That means that you've got your distribution, sorry, you've got your distribution ch channel in place. You've got several stockists around the world. Uh, you're actually making some decent sales. Uh, perhaps your company is not yet um, uh, trading, you know, uh, with, uh, um, so, sorry, is not yet having lots of many revenues, but, but it's important to show, to demonstrate, to be able to show that you actually uh, uh, have some products which sell well and that you've got some stockists in place and uh, that you've really thought out also your supply chain, uh, you've got some, um, some, some, some good agreements with your suppliers and manufacturers. This is when you have proof of concept that you can actually reach out to a business angels. Before that, it's going to be very difficult. Um, Business angels are quite sceptic towards uh, fashion startups. They do not feel comfortable assessing the, uh, and valuing the inner uh, quality of a fashion product that is shown to them by the f fashion entrepreneurs. I've been told that many times by VC VCs or, or uh, business angels. They just don't really, they're not fashion guys, you know. So, they, so I've got a funny story to tell you quickly about that. Um, it was told by Tamara Mellon when she was interviewed by VFT a few years ago. Tamara Mellon, is the co-founder of Jimmy Choo, as I'm sure you know, and um, she was telling, she was speaking about Robert Ben Susan, the um, chief executive officer of um, Jimmy Choo at the time, who um, started to speak to some private equity guys uh, called uh, in, in a, for a who were working for a private equity fund called Phoenix in 2001. And he said to them, oh, guys, you should really invest in uh, in in Jimmy Choo. You know, it's it's we do great products and we. Phoenix guys said to him, Jimmy who? So Robert Salsusan said, well, just go back to your wives tonight and ask them about Jimmy Choo and then come back to me. And they did. The private equity guys um, did that and they came back and they were brimming with enthusiasm, uh, Tamari Mellon says. So they actually had to ask their wives what they thought about the product to get convinced that this was a good company to invest in. 
So this is, the, and this is true, you know, these guys, they wear, in they wear pinstripe soaps all, uh, all year round. So if you, if you show them a, a fashion product, they won't be able to set that. What they want to see is that the fashion entrepreneur is professional, business-minded, business plan-oriented and prepared. How do you get prepared? You draft a business plan. Well, this is rule of thumb. You want to go to some equity guys? You need to have done your homework. You need to have prepared. You need to have prepared a business plan. If you don't see this, forget it. Don't even contemplate going to uh, some equity money. It will be just a waste of time to everyone. I'm, I'm tough here, but you need to ha I need to raise your awareness about this. I'm terribly sorry. You need to prepare your business plan. Otherwise, don't even contemplate going to an equity person. He won't, he won't speak to you. There's so much competition. Um, so what is a business plan? A business plan is a formal statement of a set of business goals, the reasons they are believed attainable, and the plan for reaching those goals. The business plan may contain some background information about the organization or team attempting to reach those goals. In a business plan, you should set out um, a three to five year business plan, sorry. So basically your business plan should relate to a period between three to five years, even seven, because this is the time frame within which the equity investor will want to invest in your business. Um, they will also want to get the um, information about the annual return within that time frame, three to five to seven years. So in this business plan, it's critical to include some project projected earnings and cash flow figures for the next three to seven years and a clear list of the budget allocation um, that you are going to make once you've received some funding from these equity guys. How are you going to use the money, basically? So in this business plan, it's critical to set out a detailed, a detailed market study about your clients and prospects. Do you know who your clients are? Do you have some invoices? Well, put a copy of your invoices into your business plan. Demonstrate that you already have uh, uh, some, uh, some orders and um, some account receivables, that basically you are trading, that you have proof of concept. Um, so what about your supply chain? You need to set out in your business plan that you've really worked out your supply chain. You've got your, um, your uh, supply chain sorted, you know exactly who your supplier are and your ma manufactur manufacturers if you need to use them. You've actually uh, signed with them some known disclosure agreement in place, some NDA, to make sure that you've actually protected your uh, intellectual property, your designs, when you've given them some, some drawings of what they should do. You've, you've, before you gave them that, these drawings, you actually signed an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement with them. Um, you need to explain all these, all these, this, that you've actually really looked at all these aspects into your business plan and when you also speak to these business angels. Um, one thing I forgot to mention actually about this confidentiality is that on the first page of your business plan, it's really important also to set out a confidentiality provision along the following lines. Uh, this business plan has been um, addressed to solely to you, has been addressed for... Um, your own, own and sole review. You are not supposed to send it to anyone else, any third party, and all the information set out in this business plan is completely confidential. Something along those lines should be set out on the a confidentiality provision should be set out on your business plan. It is quite important because you don't want the business angel to actually forward it on to all his mates in the city, you know, 1,000 people. So before you send the business plan out, of course, you need to make sure that you can trust that person. You need to check the reputability of the business angel so that, you know, he's not going to divulge it to anyone because he wants to keep his reputation as being a, 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 an honest and, uh, and uh, um, yeah, individual and gentleman. So don't even try to have a, a, a business angel or an equity person sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, they won't do it. I've asked, they won't even contemplate. It means basically it conveys the, the message that you don't trust them. Um, so don't, don't do that. Um, coming back to what should be set out in your business plan, which really is, is explaining what your strategy is for the next three to seven years, so it, it contains vital information for your business, you should also set out your distribution channel. 
Um, so where are you going to sell your items? In department stores, um, in indie independent boutiques, through e-commerce, pure e-tailers? Are you going to sell them at sports stores? Um, what are you going to do with an unsold stock? Have you thought about that? Are you going to go through discounters, e online discounters, or you some village, can't remember what it's called, but you know it's outside London and you can actually... Here you go, uh, that one. <laughs> um, so they will grill you. The equity guys will grill you. And they will ask you questions about what is the wor best case scenario for your business and what is the worst case scenario. And they will ask you lots of questions about the worst case scenario and you, how you're going to deal with it. Um, a bonus would be if you already have some franchising or licensing agreement in place for your fashion label. By that I mean um, that Quite a lot of brands nowadays, they have some um, basically licensees uh, whereby they can actually um, assign the use of a trademark so of their intellectual property to some licensees, uh, uh, which in turn create some products uh, using that brand. For example, um, eyewear, perfumes, this is where you do a lot of most fashion and luxury businesses have got licenses in place for their eyewear and perfume products. Um, even also ch children wear. Children wear is very often um, done by some licensees. So if you've already managed to actually strike a deal with a licensee to get this new perfume deal on, it's great. Put it on your business plan because that means that it will generate some, some income, some, some royalties uh, for your business. Now, Another aspect which is very important for your fashion startup is that um, you need also to think about the presentation of your intellectual property. As I mentioned before, John Alexander, he registered his trademark before he actually put his uh, crowdfunding uh, campaign on, uh, on, on, online. So that's already done. But if you, for example, you create an innovation which is new and has some uh, um, industrial applications, then it's also good to ap apply for a patent. In the fashion sector, there aren't many in, in, in new innovations, so to speak, but there is one area where it's quite important to do so, is when you create a new, um, I mean, the one area where usually patents are required is uh, m women's underwear. For example, I don't want to go too much into this, so if you have some questions, um, come to me after the presentation. But recently, a patent was actually taken on some uh, new bra. It was called the 100-way uh, bra. So let's not go to, too much into this, but patent could also be relevant to your business. And, and then again, you have to put in place a um, strategy for the uh, registration and protection of your designs, as I, dis as, as I mentioned earlier, when John Alexander went to own it. Um, so that also needs to be all explained in your business plan. Because that is the core of your brand. This is the, the most important asset you have is your intellectual property when you've got a fashion label. Right, okay, so we've talked about, about the equity, we've talked a lot about the uh, equity money. La now let's go back to working capital requirements. As I told you before, working capital requ requirements are going to be critical, especially at the beginning of your business. Um, another definition for working capital, so that you can really grasp this concept, which is a bit complicated, is that basically working capital is the interval quantified in time of a transformation of the result into cash. Okay? The lower the working capital, or the highest the rotation of working capital, the more cash is generated. So usually working capital is financed by short-term instruments, such as an overdraft. Um, it's interesting, for example, to note that um, a company which wants to develop some business in Southern Europe will probably end up with having more working capital requirements than a company which is based in Northern Europe or I think England or the, 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 the Scandinavian countries. Why? Because the culture in Southern Europe is that you take longer to pay your uh, account receivables than in uh, Northern Europe. So, for example, in Italy, it can take up to 120, 160 days to get paid in fashion trade. Yeah, uh, that's right. So, um, for example, I, I go to a lot of trade shows and I was at Who's Next um, uh, around two weeks ago in Paris and I spoke to the owner of a brand, of a fashion brand called Sissoun, uh, Audrey, and she explained that when she started a business, 
um, in, I think, in the 90s, no banks would lend her anything. She wouldn't manage to get an overdraft. So she started to do all this trade show thing. And then all the Japanese buyers were very, very interested in her products. Sesun is a very nice brand. They actually sell internationally a lot. We've got 200 stockists worldwide. And in particular, they sell on ASOS.com. OK, so it's, it's, the products are really beautiful. Japanese buyers immediately saw that. And they started placing some orders. And what is fantastic with Japanese uh, buyers is that they pay 50% and deposit when they place the orders. Cool. So Oda was able actually to get enough money to uh, f through the deposits to actually finance the orders with her suppliers. Because she would also make, give them a, a 30 to 40 percent deposit when she would place the orders. And then she would rush to actually do all the orders for the Japanese um, uh, buyers. She would get paid when she would deliver those orders to the Japanese buyers, the outstanding 50 percent. And with that, then she would actually honor the, uh, the European orders because the European buyers were not paying any money on deposit when, uh, when they were placing the orders. What can you do? It was not the, it was not the practice at the time. So common sense advice from me to you, sell only to solvent clients. Negotiate the payment conditions, both with your uh, suppliers and your buyers. If possible, ask for 20-30% deposit um, from your buyers. And um, if possible, refuse to pay more than, I'd say, 50% deposit to your suppliers, if possible. Uh, certainly do not pay 100% um, uh, of the money to your suppliers straight away because it's going to make your working capital requirements enormous and, um, and also you don't have any leverage anymore on the supplier um, if you've paid 100% of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of the order straight away. Stock mainly uh, products with strong commercial potential and wide margins and if possible do not accept consignment orders. Of course if you absolutely want to be at this super hip concept stores such as Dover Street Market or Colette, fine, you can make an exception. You really want to be there at sustainment, so you accept a consignment order. Otherwise, consignment orders are really difficult to manage. It means that you, you never know when you're going to be paid. But consignment order is when basically you just give the product to a shop and the shop will pay you only when they get the, um, the, the when they actually manage to sell the, uh, the, the, the product to their customers. So you could be paying in a year's time. So from a, a, a management of your working, sorry, from a cash flow management standpoint, it's, it's, it's very tough. So do not accept consignment of orders if possible. So, um, okay, so John Alexander, yeah, he needs to actually free up the value of his sales ledger, his sales receivables. Because at the moment, his account receivable, sorry, at the moment, his problem is that his, his business is growing, but he doesn't have the cash to actually order, sorry, uh, honor the orders made by his, uh, his buyers. He, because they don't pay him any deposit, because they are European buyers, he, he's, he's left in the situation where he, he's got to turn down some orders because he doesn't, he doesn't have the money to actually pay the suppliers. So it's a vicious circle. He wants to get out of his vicious circle and get into a, um, a virtuous circle. So what does he do? He speaks to Hilden Corporation, which is based in New York. Hilden Corporation is a factor, a fashion factor. They are specialized in providing fact factoring services to fashion businesses. For example, they look after Alexander Wang. Um, they used to look after uh, Mark Jacobs before he was part of the LVMH group. They also uh, work with Nicholas Kirkwood here in the UK. They are trying to actually develop their brand in, Euro in Europe. And, um, and basically what they do is that Again, they lend you against your uh, invoices. They use your invoices as collateral. So you give them the invoices, they give you 90% of the invoices straight away within 24 to 48 hours. And um, they will chase the, uh, they will collect, hi, they will collect the uh, invoices for you. So they will do the credit control. They will go after your, your clients and they will make sure that the accounts receivables are paid. OK, once the money comes in, they will give you the 10 percent, uh, the outstanding 10 percent minus their fees. OK, that is the job of a factor. And here you have to see that it's slightly different from another type of um, invoice uh, dis uh, financing, which is called uh, invoice discounting. In invoice discounting, which is available for companies with a turnover of at least one uh, half a million pounds, 
Invoice discounting is where you get this 90% um, uh, of your 90% uh, of the value of your invoices straight away, but you keep the credit control, i.e. it's going to be your internal, your in-house um, accountant people who are going to chase your, uh, the payment of these uh, account receivables. But that is not really opened for companies which ha make less than $500 uh, million or pounds of turnover. So here, in any case, with John, John Alexander, what he needs is invoice factoring, and he gets it. He gets it. He could have gone, actually, uh, another route. What he could have gone to actually free up his, uh, his, uh, his um, sales ledger, he could have also gone to purchase order financing. Purchase order financing is basically uh, a short-term commercial finance option that provides capital to pay your suppliers up front so your company does not have to deplete its cash reserves. So usually the um, company and Hilden Corporation does that as well, and they call it entrepreneurial finance. Um, so that usually comes with some personal guarantees from the uh, fashion entrepreneur, okay? But what they do is that they will provide your supplier with a letter of credit uh, from Hilden Corporation, for example, showing that his, uh, his order will be paid. And once the... Um, um, yeah, sorry, once the supplier has actually delivered the goods, then it will get paid 100%. So this is called purchase order financing. If you've got more questions about this, come to speak to me after the, after the presentation. Um, right, okay. Very quickly, um, John Alexander now thinks that he is at the stage where he's got to develop his, his business internationally. And in the UK, we've got this great scheme, which is called the Trade Show Access Programme, which um, is managed at a national level by UKTI, UK Trend Investment, a very dynamic agency. Um, and for the fashion sector, it's actually managed by UK Fashion and Textile. Okay? And UKFT um, organises some trade shows um, around several key destinations for the fashion community, so that the, uh, Briti the, the, the British-based, England-based fashion entrepreneurs can go out there and show their products at these various trade shows. You usually have a, little, a, a, a small grant towards the cost of your stand, of your booth, uh, of between 1,000 to 3,000 pounds, depending on which sector you go. If you go to the BRICS, I think you'll, ha you'll have a grant of 2,500 pounds towards the cost of your stand. And it's great. I mean, for example, in August, these guys are going to uh, The Hub, which is a new trade show in Hong Kong. Um, and um, yeah, that's where I met Fyodor in Golan at Tranoi in March 2013 in Paris. So uh, John Alexander, of course, takes advantage of this to actually show in various uh, destinations. P.T. Uomo in Florence, Bread and Butter in Berlin. Now, uh, the business of John Alexander is at the, um, is at the emerging growth stage, and it is a critical stage of the entrepreneur's life b cycle. Um, once an entrepreneur has been able to demonstrate a market for the product or service, the venture enters the emerging growth stage. So the company will be earning some revenues, but it is unlikely to be sufficient to actually fund the, the expansion of this business. So that means that some external finance will be needed to um, invest into infrastructure, get some bigger premises, and also hire some employees. Now with a track record uh, behind him and uh, a management team that has demonstrated his competence, John Alexander is in a much better position to actually go to speak to banks and why not some VCs as well. So bank financing. In the UK, it's bad. It's really bad. Uh, the banks are, um, and this is a personal opinion that I have, not playing their role into, um, into uh, supporting entrepreneurs in the UK. And the reasons that they put forward is that now they have to comply with all these Basel free regulatory requirements and uh, what do they do? You know, it's cost of capital is, be is becoming so much more expensive. Um, so either they stop lending to SMEs altogether or they pass on the cost of this um, um, higher borrowing rate to, uh, to their to, to, to the borrowers. So nowadays in the UK you've got some, um, some borrowers who find themselves with much higher 
uh, interest rates to pay to get the same type of financing that they, that they used to have before 2007, before the financial crisis. John Alexander tries to apply and he, he doesn't get through. He goes to his, bank's, uh, his dad's bank and they say no, they turned him down, he can't get a loan. Uh, so what does he do? Uh, you can see actually the crash, 2000, 2008, 2007, bang, it went down and then now it's coming back up. But still, for SMEs, it's very dif difficult. They've been disproportionately affected by the financial crisis, SMEs. So John Alexander, coming back to him, sorry, he can't secure a loan. What does he do? He comes to me. Now he's, he's got the ability to actually uh, have a lawyer. And he speaks to me about his trouble, not being able to get some bank financing. And I said to him, John Alexander, why don't you apply Sorry, for the, uh, yeah, to, for a credit guarantee scheme. That's what you should do. Since May, March 2012, a um, national loan guarantee scheme has been set up in the UK. And that is um, a scheme which helps businesses access cheaper finance by funding, but sorry, by reducing the cost of bank loans and of a scheme by 1%. This enterprise finance guarantee provides a 75% guarantee um, on each individual loan issued under the scheme. And thanks to that, it's hopefully easier for uh, fashion entrepreneurs to get some access to, to bank finance. In France, they've even created a fashion bank, which um, is a, 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 a credit guarantee scheme for fashion entrepreneurs. Um, when you actually negotiate with your banker to get a loan uh, agreement. It's going to be called the corporate facility. It's possible that they will ask you for uh, a personal guarantee. My advice is do have all these documents reviewed by your lawyer, your solicitor. It's really important because something you really don't find yourself, uh, you, you, the situation you don't want to find yourself in is your business is not going very well uh, and, and then it becomes very easy for the bank to actually um, uh, basically uh, use this personal guarantee to also have access to your, your house, uh, all your assets, your personal assets. So if, if it's already complicated in your business life, you want to make sure that you've got all the protections in place in the personal guarantee uh, so that you, you, your, your bank cannot have access too easily, <laughs> at least, to your, uh, to your personal assets. Um, probably the bank is also going to ask for some security over uh, assets of a business, your inventory, uh, your intellectual property. Again, I would really suggest that you have your uh, solicitor reviewing these documents because you want to make sure that um, they are watertight and they are, it's not going to be too easy for a bank to actually um, take, take uh, your, uh, your, your assets, your, 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 your business assets um, to, to away from you. Um, there are plenty of other points that uh, need to be negotiated in the loan agreement itself, um, but I think we need to move forward now. So if you have some questions about loan, uh, uh, co corporate facilities, don't hesitate to come to me afterwards. Okay, so other avenue when you're at the emerging growth stage is to go to VCs, venture capital. Remember what I said, first stage of equity financing, business angels, second stage, venture capital, VCs. Um, London is the, I'd say, yeah, it's the capital of VC communities in Europe. Um, so this is the place to be and, and it's great for fashion entrepreneurs. Um, VCs expect to get a return of between five and ten times their initial equity investment in about five to seven years. So that means that the companies receiving equity finance are expected to produce an annual return for investors of, of, of at least 26%. This is really high. I spoke to um, James, who is the co-founder of uh, the VC uh, fund called Find, Invest, Grow, actually at the launch of his creative industry finance uh, scheme I was talking to you about. And he was saying that we, what he expects when he invests into a company is to get a uh, return of five, 15 times, one five, 15 times his money back within three to five years. Ooh. So the average investment is eight times his money back. Personally, I don't think that this is compatible with uh, a fashion startup, with a fashion business, especially if it's a high-end fashion business when you want to make it a luxury uh, fashion business. The, I, I think really when you are looking for some equity finance, you really have to gauge whether this VC fund has some experience investing into consumer goods companies because 
um, if they try to impose you a time frame where they cut every cost, every marketing, co co uh, um, sorry, every marketing cost, um, every PR cost to put your your luxury products in the best places with with the best uh, best magazines, etc. They try to cut all the cost and they force you to um, to, to, to basically have this return on 15, 15 times uh, their money back then it's going to be very incompatible, I think it's going to be incompatible with developing on the long term a high-end fashion business. So be careful who you get married with, so to speak. Um, yeah. Um, so the, in, the, in G20 countries like in the UK, uh, after the financial crisis, the VC community mainly invest into later stage companies to help, the, to help them commercialize their business and accelerate growth from uh, a sales and marketing standpoint. They will not invest in uh, startups, as I mentioned before. There has been a consolidation of VC firms, which has reduced opportunities and increased the competition for available funding. So again, you need to have a very, very strong uh, business plan and you need to be super prepared when you speak to VCs. They have invested a lot in, uh, in um, uh, fashion tech startups. For example, Farfetch, the uh, pure e-tailer, got a $20 million financing earlier this year. This year. The Guild Group as well got $236 million of, uh, of uh, VC money earlier this year. All these fashion tech startups are getting the uh, biggest part of the, the VC money. Why? Because VCs are looking for big exits. Okay? A few years ago, the pure retailers like net a and Asus.com make massive uh, return on the investments to the VCs. Okay? And the VCs are looking for this type of fashion tech startups which are going to be the next net apporté and ASOS of this world. So they're investing in uh, Moda Operandi, Little Fashion Gallery, Wool and the Gang, all these online based fashion businesses. Perhaps, you know, food for thoughts, perhaps you should think, uh, you should think of turning your, your, your fashion label into something which is more accessible online because that is the way of the future. Right, okay, once you've got this bank um, uh, money or this equity money secured, what do you do? Well, you keep on working. You keep on working and having a vision for your business. You keep in touch with your financial stakeholders. Um, you, of course, you need to stay on top of your uh, loan repayments for your, for, your, uh, for your loan if you've got one. Um, you also need to um, you know, keep in touch with your equity backers. They'll probably sit on the board they probably ask to, to, uh, to get a seat on your board, so you need to you know, update them about your successes, about the press clippings, about the new stockist you get. Uh, they want to have some tangible evidence that you are doing well. And um, uh, yeah, and develop a, fr a thriving business. Follow the principles of lean manufacturing. What is lean manufacturing? It's basically a production practice that considers the expenditure of resources for any goal over, over than the creation of value for the end customer to be wasteful and thus a target of elimination. So the typical example of lean manufacturing uh, for a fashion business is do not keep all this stock of this inventory on your racks in the studio. Just get it out there to a stockist, to uh, a, a shop, because it should be actually uh, been seen by some potential clients who can buy them. You know, don't keep all this inventory in your st in your in your in your studio. It needs to go out uh, in the world and be sold. Um, plan ahead. Think about what is going to be the next stage for your business, uh, which is now at the emerg emerging growth stage, and uh, update your business plan. Now, very very quickly. Uh, you are at the expansion stage. John Alexander is at the expansion, sta expansion stage, which is that he's proven his business model. Um, he's proven that his business model is effective. And the focus shifts to rapidly scaling up the venture to capitalize on the growth opportunity. That means that his, fashion, uh, his menswear fashion label is a success in the UK. It works super well. Every British man wants to wear his, uh, his products and he's now done, started to do some shoes, he's got a perfume on and uh, now he wants to scale it. I, he wants to go international with it and also he wants to be both online and offline. When you have demonstrated your concept, now you actually need to reap off a pro pro the profit from that by scaling it. So expansion is all about scaling up. 
um, the company will prob will, will, is, is already profitable or at least oh, sorry, has some free cash flow that can be channeled um, into investments and that will facilitate the growth. But these um, profits are probably unlikely to be enough to achieve the pace of expansion that is desired. For example, I don't know if you heard about Marnie, the Italian fashion brand. They actually sold off to um, uh, Oliver Brave, which is the holding company um, uh, owned by Renzo Rosso, the founder of Diesel, and uh, he also owns uh, Victor and Rolf, etc. Marnie was desperate to open some big flagship stores um, in the US and probably also in Asia, but they didn't have the, the cash flow to do it. So they found this agreement with, uh, uh, with uh, Renzo Rosso to be able to finance the expansion. But to keep control over your business, I think that um, it might be best, instead of doing a pure, simple acquisition like Christopher Kane did or many other businesses, I think it's also inter interesting when you are at the expansion stage to have a look at other avenues where you keep control over your business. Because, I mean, John Alexander, this is his baby, you know, that's what he's been doing since he was 24 and he wants to keep control over his business. So what does he do? Um, he tries to do an IPO, an in initial public offering. So initial public offering in the fashion sector, IPOs, have been actually quite successful recently. Uh, Salvatore Ferragamo and Brunello Cuccinelli have actually done an IPO on the Milan Stock Exchange quite recently. They've managed to actually return um, investment for their shoulders of 100% since they did the IPO. Fabulous. Michael Kors in the US did an IPO, I think earlier this year or, or um, in 2012. Even better, their return since the IPO, 200% um, on the investment of their shoulders. So IPOs in the fashion sector are doing very well. Uh, at the moment and what it, it is quite interesting is that through these IPOs you can pay back your debt and you can also finance your expansion. Prada for example, very highly geared as a company Prada, they tried to do an IPO in 2001, failed, 2002, failed, 2007, failed again and then eventually in 2011 they did their IPO on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, managed to pay back quite a lot of the debt, they were really, they have more than 2 billion uh, euros of debt they had and then they also managed to finance their expansion. So it's a good way, IP, an IPO, to finance this expansion and keep control over your business. Uh, another way is go to private equity, guys. As I mentioned before, uh, Jimmy Choo did that. They did that. They sold off a $45 million majority stake uh, to Phoenix, the private equity fund, in 2001. In 2004, Phoenix sold the business to another private equity fund called Lion Capital for 100 million pounds, which sold it on to Tower Brooks uh, for 185 million pounds in 2007. So basically, Jimmy Choo has been changing um, owner every three or five years since 2001. Tamara, Tamara Mellon sorry, quit the business. She just d decided to leave because she doesn't, w w in this article she, um, she in, in this article published in VFT, she said these guys do not have any long-term view. Um, they just in it to actually reap the rewards for three or four years. They also put a lot of debt in the company because basically to buy the company they need to, they need to do some medicine in finance and LBO. Um, I mean, they need to put a, a lot of debt in it to actually be able to finance it. And then three or four years after they exit. And so in terms of building a, a luxury brand, it's very complicated because in, when you build a, a luxury brand, it takes time. It takes time. Um, so now, actually, um, Jimmy Choo is owned by Labelux, the German um, privately owned luxury group that also owns uh, Bailly and Bellstaff since 2011. So they left the private equity um, uh, world. But other s stories about private equity investments in f luxury brands are, for example, the um, uh, acquisition by Permira, the private equity fund, of the F Valentino Fashion Group in, um, in 2007 for 2.6 billion euros. It, was, it didn't work out at all. Um, it was sold earlier, earlier this year or last year to the Qatar royal family for 700 million euros. I'm talking about, about Valentino. The brand Valentino was sold so at, at a loss to, uh, to the uh, Qatar royal family. What Pamira really wanted to get at is 
uh, was actually Hugo Boss. The brand, the brand Hugo Boss was part of a uh, Valentino fashion group and that was profitable. So Permira has, uh, is still an, the owner of Hugo Boss as of today, but um, otherwise the, the love story with, uh, with Valentino didn't end well. And there are many other stories like this. So I don't think that for uh, high-end luxury brands, um, private equity investments are the way forward. But you never know. Sometimes you can invest in a good consumer goods, uh, a private equity fund, like for example, JP Partners, which is based in the US, which has invested in La Perla or Alex and, and Annie, and they are consumer goods focused, and maybe they will do better. Yes. Yeah, doesn't uh, Friends of School belong to the Valentino Group by now as well, and how does that affect them? I think that it is a good point because Valentino actually might be. Um, I will have to check about this, but basically, Renza Scholar is owned by Fiori. No, no, hang on, hang on. And Fiori is owned by Fast Fashion. Fast Fashion is a Japanese brand which is the owner of Uniqlo and also Comptoir des Cotonniers. And they also own Fiori. And I understand that uh, Fiori is the, Fiori, sorry, is the uh, majority hold, is the majority shareholder of Prince's Cola. So, what was your point about? Uh, well, whatever it was attached to. You said there was a Valentino group was sold uh, at a loss uh, to Qatar. Ju just the Valentino brand. The Valentino Ju brand. Yes, Premiera kept um, through, through the Hugo Boss. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Right, um, so expect in the future to see more deal frenzy going on. Uh, Tory Burch, the very, very fast growing American brand, fashion brand, could be uh, the next candidate for an I IPO. And um, ho hostile, um, hostile acquisitions are on the books as well, with Hermes, obviously, heavily courted by LVMH. Um, Ferragamo, Chanel might be also. Um, targets for, uh, for, uh, for uh, acquisitions in the future. And um, yeah, another avenue for going through the capital markets to raise some funds. So you could do that through corporate bonds or high yields or go to a junior exchange such, uh, such as IM, A I E M in the, in the UK. Right. Um, in a nutshell, um, I'd like to say that finding the right investment, uh, sorry, finding the right finance partner and finding solutions for your fashion business is critical. It's going to stay with you a long time. And um, especially if you are a young enterprise, which is at the seed or a startup stage, it's and you are therefore quite vulnerable as a brand, it's really important that as well as doing a lot of work on producing the best products and fashion uh, and fashion out there, you also make sure that you, you, you pair up with some um, savvy and, um, and understanding financial partners. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And if you have some questions, don't hesitate. Thank you. And if you have to go, don't hesitate as well. <laughs> Bye, Frank. Bye -bye. All right. Bye, bye, Isette. Yes. Sorry. Go on, go on, go on, guys. I've got a friend who's. You assume that from the beginning it starts from a designer trying to get money out of business and make a business. I've got friends who are retailers, who have stores and now internet stores. Uh, do you think if you went to a, a funder as a retailer? in the fashion world mm -hmm. to build an empire as opposed to being a designer to come to the, to the business. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think that could really work well because, um, as I said, um, equity investors are looking for a way to make money. <laughs> so if you, are, if, if you are a retailer, yeah. you can actually demonstrate that you've got this amount of uh, of, of clients and uh, that you've got this, you know, this amount of brick and mortar, mortar stores. If you also think of developing your presence online, I think it would be a plus for you to, uh, to get some, some equity investment. Um, but I, I, I do not see why, I mean, as strong as the business planning, as long as the business plan is very strong and you've got some um, projected cash flow and earnings figures which show that you can, you, you can r return some of the investment for the equity um, in, in investors within a, a f time frame of three to five, seven years, um, it could be of interest to consumer, uh, consumer goods focused equity investors.
just that when you when you get to the big sell, you know, you're a Chanel or something like that. They're looking for a brand, you know, a design brand, even though Chanel is dead, of course. But, uh, Oh, Chanel is not dead. I, th I think oh, Chanel is, is the one of the most liked uh, brands in the uh, uh, world. Oh, right, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah, she is. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, um, what works today, I mean, this is my personal opinion, but what works today, uh, today is high-end fashion and luxury. This part of a, this segment of a, of a, mar of a market, and um, I, I think, has not suffered uh, too much. Um, because now a lot of emerging, a lot of um, uh, new, newly wealthy people from emerging markets, the BRICS, are very attracted uh, from a, a, to, to, and are status conscious. So the way for them to demonstrate their new, newly acquired wealth is to buy uh, luxury items. It can range from fine art to, uh, to the latest uh, Hermes bag. And, um, and also consumers from these emerging gro growth countries are becoming more and more... Um, I'd say uh, sophisticated in the in the uh, in, in the uh, tastes. Uh, I understand, and again, I'm I'm, not, I'm a lawyer, you know, so I'm not a I'm not a professional in this type of marketing thing. But my impression from what I read in the press and in the studies is that, for example, Japan, Japanese Chinese sorry uh, buyers were very happy and proud a few years ago to wear a lot of uh, uh, brands with lots of fashion logos on the on the bags or on the on the t-shirts etc but now they've understood that this is actually a little say common a little uh, gross and now they really want to evolve towards more cutting edge uh, designers and they're really interested in buying into Fyodor Angolan, Christopher Kane, because they really want to differentiate themselves from uh, from they they made in Hong Kong and uh, and uh, and Shanghai and and come to the UK to buy or to Paris to buy the very um, um, high end and um, exclusive designers who are still not quite famous in uh, in in uh, in Asia, for example, and that's how they differentiate yourself themselves. So the point I'm trying to get at is. I think that the, you, you should perhaps think of, of high-end fashion, luxury. It might take more time to become super profitable, but it, it, it can only grow really in the long term because uh, the emerging markets, Brazil, um, uh, Russia, um, yeah, big parts in, in South America, Mexico, Asia, Southeast Asia and, and, uh, and um, uh, China and also now Japan is coming back very strongly. They are here on all the trade shows, the Japanese, and they are very keen, very savvy buyers of, of fashion. It's, it's just going to grow. Um, so, yeah, that's my advice. Did you had a question? Yeah, so I've had some advice and I just wanted to run it by you and get your opinion. <coughs> okay. So I'm working on a startup. Um, for long and short, it's um, an ethical brand. Mm -hmm. Now, in my mind, IP was everything after a, a very good product. But I had some advice telling me that I should wait until the, the concept has been proven before I put money into IP. But, you know, we have a website. In today's hyper-connected world, Facebook, Twitter, you know, you're, you're trying to build a community before, you, uh, before you, you launch. It seems a bit risky not to have IP. Definitely. Um, so, have you registered your trademark, for example? Does your brand have a particular name? or? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, registering a trademark is only going to cost you uh, t around two, 200 pounds, you know, with UK IPOs. <laughs> it's not really going to make your company go bust, you know? So um, it, it, it is going to require a little bit of time because you need to do some thinking as to um, whether you're going to register a, a, a semi-figurative or a figurative trademark, i.e. just a name, just a name, or it's going to be with a particular logo or a particular color. You can also uh, trademark, a, a, a register a, a, a trademark over a color. So uh, you, you need to put some thinking and some energy into protecting your IP. but. Uh, personally, I think it is going to be essential because uh, it happens all the time, you know, for uh, for brands to be knocked off, both on their names, uh, brands, uh, so, so they name their the brand, or on their designs, on uh, on the products that they make. Not so much here, I'd say, because in Europe we are quite well protected with uh, strong um, um, European Union level regulations in relation to. Um, trademark and, and design. So as I said before, you can register a, com a community, a community um, design which will co protect you throughout the European Union. So that's 28 countries, 
quite a lot. Or you can also have a community registered trademark. Again, protection within 28 other countries. So I also would advise to, uh, to register straight away a community registered trademark or, or, uh, or, uh, or uh, design. It's not really, I don't think it's really worth just registering it at the national level only. But uh, coming back to your point, I think it's very important. I was recently uh, on the 8th of uh, July at a um, seminar in Paris in relation to cyber counterfeiting and counterfeiting. And there was this guy who is an owner of an uh, of, uh, uh, eyewear factory and uh, he's, he's doing very well. I think he's making more than 8 million euros of turnover every year. He's been doing that all his life, really. But what I'm trying to, to say is that he said, I would not be where I am now if I had not been super... Uh, conscious of protecting my, uh, my, tr my, my, my intellectual property and fighting for it. This person, um, this, this, uh, yes, this, this entrepreneur, this eyewear entrepreneur has done quite a lot of lawsuits to protect his intellectual property because his glasses were uh, in, infringed many, the design of his glasses were infringed many times. He said it was very tough um, when they, 90% uh, would back down, but sometimes they wouldn't, you know, the infringers, they would keep on, and you have to actually uh, go to, to, to do a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. a and uh, that I thought was, you know, re you really want to make sure that you've got the financial backing to do this. He, he did it. And uh, he said, if I had not protected my IP and fought for the protection of it, yet basically made, enforce the protection of my IP, I wouldn't be where I am today. Because the problem is that if you let an infringer uh, use your, your brand or your designs, etc. You've done all the research and development, yeah? You are the one who invented all this, but they are actually reaping off the investment, your investment, um, of all this RD that you did. And uh, why, why would that be allowed? And in Europe, we are really uh, blessed that we have a good protection system, especially in France, super strong. Um, in, the UK, in the UK, fashion design, fas fashion copyright and fashion design does not exist. Uh, sorry, I meant the US. Apologies. The US, they don't have any protection. So it's also probably why we have the likes of Marc Jacobs and Alexander Wang uh, working for big French fashion houses, because they know that this is where <laughs> they're going to be recognized for their trade. Because the legislator in the US considers uh, fashion copyrights and uh, design protection to be fluffy. And they've been going on and on and on for years, and they're still not changing the system. So we are really lucky to be in the UK. Apologies, you wanted to say Sorry, something. Just a just question I've got, I've been trading online for a year and a bit um, as an online boutique. Okay. I recently got an email from China saying that someone is actually trying to register um, exactly the same name in China and Hong Kong, mm -hmm. um, including the URL and the brand name. So um, I presume it's a little bit scammy um, because you're asking obviously money for me to register Probably. My in China and Hong Kong and my brand name. Yeah, exactly yeah. yeah. so uh, I just wonder, is there sort of any sort of protection? Should I be very worried and say like, hold on guys, yes, I will pay you money just to sort of make sure if I will decide in the future to expand there? Mm -hmm. safe. Or mm. should I just a little bit um, you know, relax and say, no, thank you very much. You don't have any plans for the next five years to expand into this, um, into this sort of specific area well, and, and just leave it behind. Yeah, I received a, a similar email quite recently because I, I for my own um, yeah. trademark, Prefovi, I also um, applied for this trademark in, uh, in Japan and the China and the US to register it. Um, f through the WIPO, so the World Intellectual Property Office. And since then, uh, probably someone in China noticed that I was doing this uh, uh, regi uh, expansion of the registration of my trademark in China, so they also started to send me some these spa spam emails. Bye bye. And um, what I did is that. Uh, Bye, bye, have a good day. I, I looked, oh, by the way, sorry, I wanted to say apologies. Um, if you want, I'm going to follow up by sending you some emails with my, my slides. So if you want to actually put your business card um, close to the bar, there's a little bowl in which you can put your business cards and I will be able to follow up with you if you wish to. Um, so sorry, so coming back to your point, I do not think that you, you should even reply to these guys before you actually check who they are. The email I received was coming from an organization. As soon as I Googled it, I saw that they actually are known for being sending some spammy emails around. So, you know, so actually I did reply to them. I said, who are you? I mean, you say that you are a domain name um, organization, but are you talking about registering my trademark in, in China? So, you know, if you well, how, does, how does that work? I mean, domain name is very different to a, a trademark. So explain to me who you are. I don't think that you should, uh, you should take these emails with a pinch of salt, really. And, uh